The media is evil. That's all there is to it. That's the topic of today's Bold and Blunt. And I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. Look around at what's taking place in America. This last year, this last couple years, all under Donald Trump, whenever there's a Republican in power, whenever there's a Republican politician who takes the platform, the media goes nuts. The mainstream media goes nuts on their watchdoggy type views. And all of a sudden, they launch into bulldog phase and start doing background checks, digging up dirt, looking for clues, looking for answers, trying to make connections, trying to find the corruption, trying to find the scandals. In other words, they do their jobs. But when it's a Democrat, when it's a leftist, when it's one of their own, Chris Cuomo, they turn blind eyes. They're evil. There's no other way to describe it. Before I get into that, I want to give a quick shout out to edify.app backslash podcasts. It is the platform for faith-based podcasts. And I'm really happy to announce that Bold and Blunt is now part of their regular lineup. That's right. You can go to Edify and check out Bold and Blunt, which posts there Tuesdays and Thursdays. And as well as checking out Bold and Blunt there, you can also take a listen to all the other faith-based podcasts offered at the platform. So go there, check it out, edify yourself. Edify yourself for these dark, dismal, bleak times. And of course, you can always get bold and blunt at WashingtonTimes.com, along with all my commentaries that I write there every day. But look, if you don't want to do the hard work by typing in WashingtonTimes.com, you can go to WashingtonTimes.com just once. Sign up for my three times a week newsletter. It comes out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And delivered right to your email box will be all my commentaries for the week, along with my twice-weekly Bold and Blunt podcasts. Would love to have you subscribe. Would love to have you aboard. Would love to have your support for such a great news organization as the Washington Times. And of course, you can get Bold and Blunt anywhere else that podcasts are offered. And make sure you check it out because unlike many of the other forms of media floating around out there today, Bold and Blunt is not evil. Can the same be said for CNN? I understand why that was a problem for CNN. It will not happen again. It was a mistake. That was CNN's now suspended Chris Cuomo back in May. Back in May. When he came out and he apologized to viewers for advising his brother, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, or then governor of New York, how to deal with the women who were accusing him, the governor, of sexual harassment. How to deal with all those allegations. And Chris Cuomo goes on his high horse on CNN and says, I understand. I understand why CNN may be a little bit upset about that. It it doesn't seem right. And I just want you to focus on this one line that he said back then in mid-May. Listen up again. It will not happen again. It will not happen again. It was just a small lapse in judgment, a small deviation from journalistic principles. And it was done because, as Chris Cuomo himself said, he's family first, journalist second. Family first, job second. But at the same time, it will not happen again. He said it. He promised it. He told us all on CNN airwaves. It will not happen again. Well, now let's go ahead and fast forward to now, November. Just a few months later, Chris Cuomo suspended. Why? He wasn't really telling the truth back in May at least according to deposition and documents that were unsealed as part of the New York Attorney General's Office investigation into Andrew Cuomo and all his female accusers. These documents actually show that Chris Cuomo had a little bit deeper role in advising his brother Andrew Cuomo than 
previously let on than previously in his May mea culpa, or at least expression of understanding why CNN was chastising him in May. That's not really a mea culpa. That's not really an apology. But at least during his expression of sorrow over being caught in May, he didn't let on that his involvement with his brother Andrew was this deep. The documents show that Chris actually played a pretty active role in helping his brother Andrew navigate through all these allegations and accusations. So what did CNN do? CNN distanced itself from Chris Cuomo, said it was taken off guard, surprised, had no knowledge of the statements that Chris had made during the attorney general's investigation and CNN suspended indefinitely Chris Cuomo. Word on the CNN street is that Chris will probably be back in January or sometime shortly thereafter. But who knows? Who knows what CNN will do? They have an opportunity now to set the record straight and come clean as an actual news organization, which, don't laugh, they still try and present themselves this way. So why wouldn't they at least consider the idea of firing Chris Cuomo? He deserves it. But Chris Cuomo, meanwhile, has come out with another statement, another expression of sorrow. Not so much at what he did, but really, again, at being caught. Listen to what he said on a serious XM radio station. He's embarrassed, he says. He's embarrassed at, at not his actions so much as being suspended. I'm going to play the whole statement. Here it is. Hey everybody, it's Chris Cuomo. Let's get after it. Quick note about the obvious. It sounds so chipper. I've been suspended from CNN. Cut the music, huh? Uh, do me a favor, cut the music. Thank you. Yeah, because it sounds so jolly. Uh, you know this already. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it hurts to even say it. It hurts. It, here, let me deviate just for a second. Uh, I wonder if it hurts the women who accused Andrew Cuomo of sexual improprieties, sexual harassment. I wonder if it hurts those women that they find out that someone with a star-powered platform like Chris Cuomo has been busily working behind the scene to undercut their reputations and their allegations and to sort of school and coach the target of their accusations and allegations on how best to sidestep and dodge the allegations and accusations. I wonder if they're feeling any hurt at what's gone down in recent days. Well, back to Chris, back to Chris and his, and his public statement. Uh, you know this already. Uh, it hurts to even say it. Uh, it's embarrassing, but I understand it, and I understand why some people feel the way they do about what I did. I've apologized in the past. I mean it. It's the last thing I ever wanted to do was compromise any of my colleagues and do anything but help. I know they have a process that they think is important. I re well, really, the last thing he wanted to do was get caught. I mean, let's be honest here, but that ship has sailed. So now he has to come out and express hurt and sorrow, but not so much at any wrongdoing he's committed, but at the fact that he was caught and now is embarrassed by it. Embarrassed. I respect that process. So I'm not going to talk about this any more uh, than that. It hurts so too much. For right now, <laughs> let's just get after it. And there's plenty to do. What, what does that mean, get after it? Let's get after it. Get, a, get after what? Does he mean get after the women who are accusing his brother? I, I'm sure in some sense, deep down where he can't admit it publicly, that that's exactly what he means. On that score. Well, the music started again. That means his statement's over. So there you have it. 
He understands why CNN had to suspend him. It's embarrassing to him. It hurts. But hey, now we're all in this together. So let's get after it, whatever that means. And you wonder, CNN, why the American people think you are a crappy news network. CNN, crappy news network. There you have it. This is the same network that, if you recall, just went through a whole red-faced moment about all their erroneous slash biased slash fake news. Yes, let's throw that phase in there because once again, Donald Trump is being proven truthful on that count. This is the same network that just went through the red face moment about all the fake reporting it did on Russia collusion, along with, oh, the Washington Post and the New York Times and the other networks out there that just jumped the gun on attacking Donald Trump without getting their facts straight first. So Crappy News Network just went through that. Crappy News Network just went through the red-faced moment about its, I don't even want to call it biased because it's beyond biased. It's, here we go, evil. Evil, wicked reporting on the Kyle Rittenhouse trial where it's journalists, I don't don't know whether to call them journalists, where it's staffers bent over backwards to paint Kyle Rittenhouse as a white supremacist who marched into town from out of state, armed to the teeth with intent to find, shoot, and kill black people. Even though he didn't kill black people, he killed white people, but Crappy News Network went out of its way to omit the race of the victims from its coverage, right? Because that didn't fit the narrative of crappy news network that Kyle Rittenhouse was a white supremacist. So CNN just went through a red face moment with Russia collusion and the dossier and all that. CNN just went through a red face moment with Kyle Rittenhouse CNN just went through a very costly red-faced moment with Nick Sandman. You remember that kid from Kentucky who went to Washington, D.C. in January of 2019 for a March for Life rally and ended up playing Peacemaker uh, because a group of black men were taunting a, a an Omaha tribesman elder named Nathan Phillips. But the media got it wrong and portrayed this poor kid from Kentucky as if he were a racist starting trouble. And so instead of going home to Kentucky and playing dead and laying down and taking the beating from the press and taking the uh, the slurs and libelous charges or slanderous charges or both that had been slung his way, he decided to fight back and sue. And look, CNN ended up settling with him, settling a lawsuit for an undisclosed amount because CNN was one of the media outlets that was leading the charge against Nick Sandman and reporting erroneously ruining his reputation based on no fact. There you have it. CNN, crappy news network, once again. It's not just CNN. It's not just CNN. New York Times, Washington Post, ABC, NBC, and gosh, let's not forget MSNBC, and even ESPN, ESPN gets involved with all this race baiting discussion as well. But CNN is in the news right now. It's out there right now because after this long reputation of media bias, actually media evil, as I call it out, but after this long line of media bias and erroneously reporting things that damage other people's reputation, even having to enter an undisclosed amounts of settlements with people because of the erroneous slash evil reporting, CNN once again is out there going wishy-washy on a scandal involving its own. If Chris Cuomo were conservative, if Chris Cuomo were a Tucker Carlson reporting at CNN, then that Chris Cuomo would have been fired. 
if Chris Cuomo weren't such a water carrier for the Democrats, weren't such a protectionist for the global agenda pushed through Washington, D.C. in the far left Democrat Party, Chris Cuomo would be fired. There would be no suspension, indefinite or not. And there definitely wouldn't be talk and whispers about the indefinite suspension coming to an end as soon as January, for crying out loud. This is why the American people hate the media. Their powers onto themselves. They act as if they're above the law. They treat the American people with outright contempt. Their moral compass is this. If you're on the left, do as you will. Do as you want do as you wish, and we'll help cover for you. If you're on the right, watch out. They're coming for you. And look, that's why radio for conservatives has played such an important role in getting the truths that the mainstream media won't tell you. And in conservative radio, who did it better than Rush Limbaugh, right? And my guest today, James Golden, also known as Bo Snerdly, longtime friend and producer for Rush Limbaugh. He has a new book out called Rush on the Radio. He wrote it as a tribute to his longtime friend, Rush Limbaugh, and he's here today to discuss not just his best-selling book, but also the state of the nation, the state of the media, the state of America today. James, James Golden, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here with you, Cheryl. So tell me about Rush on the Radio. Why did you write it? Well, after 30 years with the most amazing broadcaster that I think was on the radio and one of the most amazing human beings that I ever met in my life. I wanted to make sure that I did my part, however small it may be, to ensure that his legacy, his story is told properly, especially since the left is fond of disparaging people that they never listen to or never bothered to find out who they are. So I wanted to make sure that some of the, uh, the, the stories that I was aware of you know, I, I tell people all the time, anybody on our staff could have written this book because they all, we all love Rush so much. It went beyond the relationship that you have with an employer. It, it's, we had loved the man because of the way that he stood for all of us. He was so generous with us, too, and so warm. And um, not at all the, the persona, the tongue-in-cheek bombastic that was on the air. That was not who he was. Very quiet, very reserved human being. Um, but at the same time, just one of the most decent people you'd ever want to meet. How did you meet him in the first place? I worked for WABC Radio. Right. Uh, and I had a history there before Rush came. In fact, I was their very last music director and the very first talk producer. I walked out of one studio producing the last music show into another to produce their first talk show. When Rush came to the station, I interestingly enough met him his first day as he was coming into the building with his business partner, Ed McLaughlin. Ed was the former uh, president of ABC Networks and he had teamed up with Rush and two others to form what was the first uh, syndication company that Rush was involved in, EFM Media. I knew Ed. I saw Ed and this guy coming into the building at 1330 Avenue of the Americas, and we all chatted. And I remember just listening to um, the excitement uh, from Rush about the show and what it was going to and what they hoped it would accomplish. And I made the remark to them, wow, this sounds like it's going to be bigger than Paul Harvey. <laughs> and boy, was it ever. This turned out to be the biggest show that radio ever had a revived AM radio, but more importantly for Russia, put a stamp on all American, uh, all American media. 
So you you were with Rush something like 30 years, right? The, yeah. It, I mean, that almost seems more like a divine appointment than just a job. Well, see, for most of us, that no matter where we came from, once we got on board with Rush, there were so very few people that left or that left for, you know, permanently left. You know, people might just take a quick view of absence to do something, but then they come back. Um, because we all stayed. It was, it was, there was no better place that most of us could think of to work with, or no better person to work with, and no better place to work. He hired truly talented people, and then he let them do their thing. We didn't have a lot of meetings. We didn't have uh, any kind of overbearing uh, supervisory structure. It was, you're hired, you know what I want, I want excellent work. Now, let's have it. And that's the way he operated. And people just loved and loved, not just the man, but loved the working environment with him. And and he had so many haters on the left. And I'm just curious. I, I don't want to go down that path because it, it, it the, there are so many out there who still attack Rush to this day. What I'm more curious about, you must have stories of people who started out hating Rush because of the things that they heard about him, but came into contact with him and found the the lies of the left had prevented them from seeing Rush's greatness and his kindness in, in the first place. So do you have any stories of people that actually changed their mind about Rush and realized what a great guy he was? Well, you know, we used to take those calls quite regularly from people who have only listened to what the critics have said or thought they knew him from some sort of media coverage <laughs> and then turned around and actually listened for themselves and discovered that who this person was it was entirely different. I have talked to individuals where that, that have come up to me at various appearances and, and have said that, that very thing. Wow, I hated this guy until I actually started listening to him. You know, um, but based on what what they believed and who they believed he was in media portrayals from the mainstream media, that goes to speak to though. It's not just Rush; it goes to speak to how dishonest and corrupt the entire mainstream media in America has become. There are two separate news. You know this better than anyone else, Cheryl. <laughs> there are two separate news universes. In one universe. You can find stories about, uh, let's say, uh, Joe Biden's son and the details of what happens there in the other media media universe. The story doesn't exist. In one media universe, you can find stories that question um, the perspective of, of things that happened on January 6th. In another universe, everybody that went to that rally is guilty of, of insurrection. Um, in one and it can go on and on and on. It can go on throughout the way that that science is is uh, covered, that math, that schools are covered, and what ha- what is happening in schools. So the mainstream media, what used to be the mainstream media, media, the has has done such a poor job in covering everybody from the right because they don't want to be honest. It is no more. They are no longer journalists. They are just a political subsidiary of the Democrat Party and of the progressives. Yep. And you know what? You yourself are a classic textbook case of that, I'm sure. You are a black guy who worked for one of the uh, most conservative voices in radio. I imagine that you must have been attacked just because of your skin color and you dare to be a conservative. Once in a while, and usually those attacks come from others. Um, like this one angry woman on, uh, bitter and angry woman on MSNBC, who seems to object anybody black thinking <laughs> differently than she does. Yep. So what? What was? But I ignore them. I don't even respond to it most of the time because the thinking is so shallow. And and besides, I'm not going to 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 live my life. Um, dealing with the haters. They're just, you know, let the haters hate and, and they'll deal with the karma of their hate the way that God decides that they should. Good for 
for you. That, that's the way to do it, really. Uh, I'm curious about you. What what was your upbringing like? Were you were you raised in a home of Christian conservative principles, or have you changed through life? Was there a a, a big metamorphosis for you? I grew up in a two parent home, which back then, even though our neighborhood was um, had shifted from a white neighborhood to becoming almost exclusively a minority neighborhood by the time I was in my uh, teens um, by a two-parent family, and those weren't uncommon, and raised, um, I was in church when I was very young. Uh, my mom was made sure of that. And in fact, yes, yeah, so I was raised with Christian values. I was raised in a two-parent home in a middle class, and to me, nothing was extraordinary about my childhood then when I look back on it now and look at the chaos that exists around this country it's almost as if wow that was some kind of miracle that we were able to get out of childhood like that you know um, and, and it was considered to be fairly common then but my, my folks were Democrat my mom was a, a Democrat Party hack up until the day that she passed. She passed three days after rush. It was a really tough week. Wow. Um, and I remember when I first started working with the show and as rush became known, uh, my mom one day came to me and, and said that her friends at church were questioning what happened to James. <laughs> and so I told her in response, I said, you know, um, well, here's what you tell your church friend, that I am still the person, I still have the same values and hold the same beliefs that I did um, that I learned from you and dad. And also, I still have the same values that I learned in our church. So the question isn't what happened to me, the question is what happened to y'all. The Democrat Party has changed so much, not just since... Uh, JFK days, right? Completely different party then. But just since Barack Obama days, it seems like the Democrat Party has just gone socialist slash communist almost. You know, I think that Obama knew that this is where his party was headed. And in fact, when he was trying to push Obamacare down our throats, he made, I, I can't recall the specific quote, but he made it, he, he said something to the effect of, this is just the first step. And this party has been headed this direction, except they had to lie about what their objectives were. They, they couldn't say up front, this is what we want back then. Right. Now, with Biden in the House, White House, and after four years of this endless Trump hate that they've been spewing, they're not going to hide in the closet anymore with what they want. They they have always wanted this massive uh, 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 cradle to grave spending. They have always wanted this lawlessness that we see at the borders, the lawlessness that we see in American cities with this so-called bail reform. They've always been about this reverse racism that they promote through critical race theory and all the rest of this hogwash that they're throwing into American schools. They've always been about this. They just don't, they just feel that they can do it openly now and they don't have to hide it and they don't have to wait and do it incrementally. And, and, and you're right on that. They've come out of the corners, they've come out of the shadows. And don't you feel something a little bit eerie going on in this nation right now with how the left is exploiting the coronavirus to just daily steal our God-given liberties? Don't you feel it's different than just political? Oh, well, sure it is. Yesterday, we can, you see the opening salvos with the so-called Omnicrom. Yes. Which sounds like, it sounds like it sounds like we should have the Marvel Studio music behind this latest strain of the disease. The Omicron is coming. <laughs> so we have a disease that's we, we have a variant that's not even here against all of these vaccinations that have now been mandated to the American people and yet they are reacting as if nothing 
has changed since the very first strain of the coronavirus came, and they're almost ready to, to start lockdowns again. Yeah. They're trying to prep the public for that yet. And, and it just happens to be hedging up on a midterm election year. Isn't that just such a coincidence? Yep. You know, I, I find myself drawing comparisons almost weekly with an Ayn Rand novel, right? Um, the Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, and how the government slowly takes over and steals individual liberties. And that would be absolutely right. She was one of my favorite, um, she was, when I, when I was many years ago, she was one of my favorite uh, authors. Yeah, uh, I haven't read. read those books in a while. But I remember the first time I read The Fountainhead, it completely blew my mind. Me too. I yeah, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for it. And, and then Atlas Shrugged, after I finally got to the end, I just, it was wow. Everything, Anne Rand had a way of actually describing not just ideologically who, uh, who the left was, but also she captured their language exceptionally well. Yes. And they're always doing this for your greater good while they get the power and the money and strip you of your liberty and your freedoms. Yep. And and the sneaky ways they operate too, right? It, it's just, it, it's like Anthony Fauci come to life, uh, seriously. Well, uh, James, I, I know our time has come to an end, so I just want to give a shout out to your uh, radio show. You, you just got this new show on WABC. What, was it in August you picked it up? It was, I was, in April I started doing Saturdays, and by August they wanted me to do uh, six days a week. So I'm doing Monday through Friday at four in the afternoon, and then Saturday mornings at eight o'clock. And uh, what, what are some of the biggest concerns, I guess, that you hear from your listeners? Are, are they feeling the shift in this nation with, with trepidation as well? They are concerned with the total, first, the inept operation in Afghanistan, I think, really shook everyone up. Yeah. The borders, the out of control crime, and of course, New York is experiencing that with these smash and grabs, not to the extent as other cities, but it certainly happened there. So yeah, people are really worried. They're worried about the future of this country and where it's going under this administration. And if Rush were alive today, Rush on the radio, your your book on Rush's uh, life and your hat tip to Rush's entire career, what would Rush Limbaugh say about what's going on in today's nation? He would say that this is not a time to panic, I believe, because one of the last things that he did say in response to that question that kept coming up is that we can never give up on America, that we have to continue to fight the left and maintain our belief that this way of government is truly, once once we can rid some of the corruption from it, truly the best form of government, not only for this country, but it has proven itself to be the best form of government for ensuring freedom and liberty around the world. So he would not be, in a, he would be optimistic like he usually, like, like he was, for the entire 33 years he was on the air. Yep, Rush Limbaugh, the eternal optimist. And James Golden, what a great guest you are for Bold and Blunt. I hope people pick up a copy of your book, Rush on the Radio. Of course they will, they don't even need me to say that, so it's destined to be a bestseller, but what a great book to write for your longtime friend. And thank you so much, James, for being on Bold and Blunt. Cheryl, my pleasure, anytime. Love your writing. And by the way, you've been a guest on the radio show, and we want you to come back. Oh, anytime. It's such an honor. I love chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I listen to James, and I I think on the work he's done and how he has been partnered with somebody like Rush Limbaugh for so many decades. And I, I think on that, and I consider how God never closes a door without opening another. God never shuts the windows without opening another. And so while we have to endure with the CNNs and the MSNBCs and the ABCs and CBSs and New York Times and Washington Post and all the others, while we have to endure with all that, we have such an open door invite when it comes to the likes of a Rush Limbaugh or a James Golden who is carrying on the same freedom-loving voice 
that Rush himself brought, the same optimistic message that Rush himself brought. There are so many open doors and open windows out there, we don't have to sit tight and just suffer the lies of the left pushed through the media. We can go out and get our own truth. We can go out and get the real truths. So I hope you're doing that. I hope you do that in part by subscribing to the Washington Times because look, I can tell you, the Washington Times is one of those few gems in America that tries hard to give you the truths that you need to fight the far leftist influences and forces that are seeking to undercut, capsize, cripple, and utterly destroy all that America stands for, including American exceptionalism. So go to the Washington Times, subscribe to the Washington Times, find my Bold and Blunt podcast at the Washington Times, sign up from, for my three times a week newsletter, WashingtonTimes.com. It comes out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with all my commentaries, along with my twice weekly Bold and Blunt podcast. And if you don't want to just go to the Washington Times, if you want to find some other faith-based podcasts to listen to, go to edify.app backslash podcast. It is the platform to go to if you are looking for Christian faith-based podcasts to once again edify you. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time. And in the meanwhile, stay blunt, stay bold.